All right, we'll move on to uh, got Jeff then online. Hello, can you hear me all right? Yeah, let me turn up the audio just a little bit. Okay. Right again. All right, can you hear me good? Yeah. Good. Great. All right, let me share my screen here. Okay, so um, I'm just going to give a, a little bit of quick background um, on how we identified a family of lift distributions that we used a lot in our analytic work uh, on this project. Um, everything good? Te technically, can you hear? Can you see all right? Yeah, we're good. Okay, hey, great. All right. So um, as with most of the analytic work on this project, we're going to start with lifting line theory. The Prandtl's classical lifting line theory, uh, using Prandtl's classical lifting line theory, we can relate the lift distribution on a wing to the wing plan form shape and the wing twist. And like Dr. Hunsaker said, when we talk about twist, we're talking about geometric twist or actually twisting the wing and aerodynamic twist, which um, is essentially changing the camber of our, our uh, airfoil sections using flaps or uh, you know conformal or articulated flaps. Um, so from lifting line theory, the lift distribution can be written in a normalized form that's shown here on the top left. Um, and that's a function here of some normalized Fourier coefficients B sub n. Now these normalized Fourier coefficients, uh, when, we, when we run through lifting line theory and we're trying to predict the lift distribution on a wing, they depend on the wing plan form and the aerodynamic or geometric twist distribution. And that's what produces the, the lift distribution. Now, in 1918, Prandtl identified an elliptic lift distribution that minimizes induced drag on wings with fixed weight and wingspan. And that's shown here in the top right. And you can see all this is is the same equation that's shown on the left, but where all the Fourier coefficients are equal to zero. And so that is how we characterize the elliptic lift distribution. So all B sub n are zero. The elliptic lift distribution has been shown since 1918 to be optimal for a wide variety of aircraft and flight conditions. And so aircraft often will fly and operate with a lift distribution that's something close to the elliptic lift distribution during cruise. And in fact, um, in, around World War II, uh, there were some planes that actually had elliptic planform shapes, like what's shown here. This is the Spitfire. So you can see the Spitfire has an elliptic planform shape. And the reason for that is because the elliptic planform produces the elliptic lift distribution with no twist. Um, but it's important to note that uh, aircraft wing of any shape, so a rectangular wing or a tapered wing, can also produce the elliptic lift distribution if the twist distribution is designed properly. And that can be geometric or aerodynamic twist. Um, Dr. Hunsaker has, has published a, a paper that gives some analytical relationships that show what the twist distribution should be for any given BN, uh, any, any series of BN or these Fourier coefficients for the lift distribution. Now, in 1933, Prandtl noted that when uh, aerostructural constraints are considered, the elliptic lift distribution may not actually be optimum, may not produce an absolute minimum in induced drag. And to illustrate that, I've shown here the induced drag from lifting line theory. That's shown here at the bottom. And you can see that for a given flight condition defined by rho, which is the density, and v infinity, which is the flight velocity, the induced drag is a function of the weight, which is w, the wingspan, which is b, and the lift distribution, which here again we characterize with the Fourier coefficients b sub n. When the weight and the wingspan are fixed, we can see really easily that induced drag would be minimized by setting all of the Fourier coefficients to zero, which is the elliptic lift distribution. However, when weight and wingspan can vary, what we'd really want is for the wingspan to be as high as possible and the weight to be as low as possible. But we can't just change those arbitrarily because of the bending moments. Um, when we increase the wingspan, the bending moments increase. 
And when we change the lift distribution, we change the bending moments. And the weight has to be designed such that it can support, the structural weight has to be enough to support those bending moments. So the weight, the wingspan, and the lift distribution are all coupled through the bending moments. And what this means is that there's some interesting trade-offs that happen um, that result um, in a minimum in, in induced drag. So to illustrate this, in the top left here, we have an image of a wing with a fixed elliptic lift distribution. And when the wingspan increases, you can see that the bending moment distribution also increases, which would require more weight, more structural weight for uh, to support it. Um, so initially, as we increase the wingspan, we get a reduction in induced drag. But at some point, the penalty that we pay from carrying more weight to support the bending moment distribution outweighs the benefits that we get from increasing the wingspan. A similar thing happens when we talk about the lift distribution, which is shown here in the bottom right. So here we can see the lift distribution changing from an elliptic shape to something that's maybe more bell-shaped. And as it does that, it, the loads are alleviated on the wing, and so the bending moment distribution is smaller in magnitude, and so we require less weight to support those bending moments. And so initially, again, we see that we get a reduction in induced drag as we reduce the weight of the aircraft, but at some point, the penalty that we pay from operating with a non-elliptic lift distribution outweighs the benefits that we get from reducing the weight. So again, there's a minimum um, in, in induced drag with some lift distribution. And when we put these together, we get a, a trade-off and a coupling that results in a non-elliptic lift distribution that gives a minimum in induced drag. So Prannell in 1933 appears to be the first to have realized this, or at least published anything on it. And in 1933, he identified a bell-shaped lift distribution that allows a 22.5% larger wingspan than the elliptic lift distribution for the same wing structure weight. And that resulted in a reduction in induced drag of about 11% over the elliptic lift distribution. Now, Prandtl made a few assumptions uh, in obtaining this lift distribution, and I'm just going to point out a few of them. One, he assumed that the moment distribution only was only came from the lift distribution. So the weight of the wing didn't contribute. He also assumed that the wing structure weight is related to the wing bending moment distribution by a somewhat arbitrary uh, proportionality coefficient uh, that remains constant along the span of the wing. Uh, he also assumed that as the wing span increases, the cord length stays the same which means that the larger wingspan wing has a different wing area, a different wing loading, and different performance characteristics than the original wing with the elliptic lift distribution. Um, now, I want to point out that Prandtl's 1933 lift distribution can be characterized using only the third Fourier coefficient. And it, we get this elliptic or this uh, bell-shaped lift distribution when the third Fourier coefficient is negative one-third. Um, now, Prandtl's uh, bell-shaped lift distribution has kind of become really popular in previous years, most notably by, uh, it was promoted by Al Bowers, who actually built a, a wing prototype that produces this lift distribution. And people have studied it for various reasons. But like Dr. Hunsaker said, it seems that this original 1933 publication is often misunderstood, and people haven't really gone back and revisited it very much. And so Dr. Hunsaker and Dr. Phillips, as Dr. Hunsaker mentioned, did a, a translation of this original 1933 paper. And we also revisited Prannell's study and decided to, to look at his assumptions and maybe relax some of them or make them a little bit more representative of what we'd really see on an aircraft. And so when we did that, um, some of the assumptions that we relaxed are first that we assumed that the moments weren't only from the lift distribution, but also uh, the weight distribution contributed to the bending moments. We also derived a proportionality coefficient that depends on the, the shape and the material of the wing structure. And so we make some assumptions about how that wing structure looks and we can get a proportionality coefficient that's consistent with that structural design. Um, we considered both stress and deflection limited designs and rather than assuming that the cord was constant as the wingspan increases, we decided to fix the wing loading first. 
Um, and the reason for this was to preserve some of the performance characteristics of the wing, because a lot of the key performance air speeds are um, heavy functions of the, of the wing loading, which is the wing loading being the uh, total weight of the wing divided by the wing area. So what's shown here are, are two lift distributions that we got out of our studies. The red lift distribution is the, for the stress limited design of a wing with fixed wing loading. And you can see that it allows a wingspan increase of about 5% and, re, and reduces induced drag by just over 4%. For the deflection limited design, the wingspan can increase by just over 1% and the induced drag is reduced by just under 1%. But something that's really interesting is that both of these lift distributions can also be characterized using the third Fourier coefficient only. Um, and actually, this is mathematically, as we looked through, as we went through this process, we actually found that all other Fourier coefficients mathematically go to zero. Um, and so that was kind of an interesting finding. We also looked at what happens if we fix the stall speed. Uh, at a max lift coefficient rather than fixing the wing loading. So as we change the wingspan, the uh, wing area in the cord has to change so that we have the same uh, stall speed and max CL. What's shown here are the stress limited and deflection limited uh, lift distributions. And you can see the stress limited design of a wing with fixed stall speed produces a bell-shaped lift distribution. In fact, it's the same as Prandtl's 1933 lift distribution. And it allows about a 26% increase in wingspan and about a 17% reduction in induced drag. For the deflection limited design, we get about a 9% increase in wingspan and around 7% reduction in induced drag. So here, all the assumptions were the same as in the previous study, only we changed that operational constraint to fixed stall speed at a max CL rather than um, fixed wing loading. But again, as we went through the math here, we found that the optimum lift distribution for both of these cases can be characterized only by the third Fourier coefficient. And so if we uh, normalize these lift distributions, all the ones that we found, and put them on the same plot, it looks something like this for various values of, of B3. And you can see all of the lift distributions fall somewhere between the elliptic lift distribution and Prandtl's bell-shaped lift distribution, which is shown in yellow. Um, and so this kind of uh, is how we identified a, a new family of lift distributions that's characterized only by the third Fourier coefficient. And that family looks something like this for various values of B3. And so if you vary this third Fourier coefficient, you can get all these different lift distributions and all in between. Um, and it's this family of lift distributions that we use throughout the analytic work on this ONR project. And you'll see that as Zach talks and um, you see it crop up all the time. So um, if you have any questions, feel free to ask. And uh, for more information, I would direct you to some of the publications that were uh, published under funding from this grant and that, um, it'll, that gives some of this, this work. So thank you. Thanks, Jeff. <clears throat> so the, so actually a lot of this work was funded by the Air Force. This was, you've seen a lot of this before. Um, but the reason we wanted to present it today is that it kind of lays the foundation for the stuff that's following. Um, and so as Jeff pointed out, there's this family of lift distribution, family of optimal lift distributions. The elliptic lift distribution is one of them, the bell-shaped lift distribution is one of them, but there are also several others in there uh, that uh, are optimum depending on the constraints that you're trying to design to. And so, um, and this family of lift distributions uh, lays the groundwork for what, where we're headed next now into uh, to yaw control, looking at lifting line theory for yaw control. We really, we focused on this family of lift distributions because they're a family of optimal lift distributions instead of looking at every possible lift distribution out there. So do we have, do we have time for questions? Yeah. Uh, so, just, uh, I have another list, but, but when I saw this, uh, the lift distribution, so when the one third, so do we ever use that? The minus one third? No, the, the positive. One third. Oh, no, the positive, one third. no. No, actually, so uh, the zero is the elliptic. Right, and, the below uh, that. And we use, we use things below this. We don't use anything about it. 
Okay. We were just trying to show what they would look like okay. with the positive feature okay. type. So the first question that I have is, so, um, so based on this theory, the 22.5% spend increase is possible, but it is all theoretical. But if you're actually changing it to the real airplane, the what kind of spend increase makes sense? Jeff, do you wanna, did you hear that question? Yeah, yeah. So um, on a real aircraft, fully real, I don't know, but we, we did some work on extending this from the purely theoretical. So we looked at what happens if we have a plan form distribution that's not rectangular, right? What if we have a tapered wing, even like a doubly tapered wing or an elliptic wing or you know something like that? And what if we have some distribution of non-structural weight in the wing? And so this was some of the work that I did there at AFRL when I was there um, a few, quite a few summers ago, I guess, but. Yeah, also I thought that you put some, uh, some realistic, uh, the structure geometry in it so that you can increase the fidelity yep. of your, um, the theory, so. Yeah, yeah, that's right. So using a numerical method, so not, we're not doing analytic work anymore, but using a numerical method, I was, a, I've, I've run this on the Ikana, airframe, which is a modified Predator B, mm -hmm. and on the CRM, the NASA CRM, which is like a transonic transport. Right. Um, and I get wingspan increase, of course not, so 22.5% is under Pranel's assumptions, but I do see wingspan increases of around 5%, even up to like 7 or 8%, and induced drag reduction of um, probably around 5% as well, so on that same order. Uh, but of course, this is all of this is assuming that we're using the same lift distribution at our cruise condition and at our like structural uh, design load condition. And uh, the second question is, uh, so so probably you're familiar with the Prentel D uh, aircraft done by NASA. Yeah. So so based on your theory, if the wing is fixed then uh, still the, the, the elliptical pressure distribution is gonna be the best. Mm -hmm. But the, do you know what the parental D, um, what they are trying to prove using that parental D airplane? Do they have some baseline aircraft to compare? Yeah, so- Otherwise it's gonna be say Still, if we have just one vehicle, parental D, it is fixed wing, we have fixed the span, right? So they cannot prove anything unless they have some kind of baseline uh, with a shorter span maybe, and then test the, the print, print of the aircraft and they can compare how, how much benefit they, they can get out of. But if they're just testing one uh, print of the aircraft, then I, I, I don't see any way that they can prove anything. So do you know what their motivation behind that? So, so I'll defer a little bit to Dr. Hunsaker on this because he's looked at this more. And in fact, that kind of leads into the next. Yeah, it does. Talk about. But they were, their purpose was not to look at reduction in induced drag. They were looking at control. And yeah. the, the bell-shaped lift distribution has some unique properties for control. And I'll let Zach and Dr. Hensaker fill you in a little bit more on that. Control. Yeah, they're actually trying to do yaw control by placing the ailerons at a certain position on the bell-shaped lift distribution. You can show that if you have the ailerons in the right place that you actually get proverse yaw instead of adverse yaw. That's what they were trying to show, which I, they were able to show, you know, they have some data to, to uh, show that works. Um, yeah. So it was not about the, the efficiency. No. But it was about all about the control. Right. Then Which is why what? they didn't have a baseline. They, that was their aircraft, right? They didn't yeah. have a baseline they were comparing it to. Not to my they knowledge. They just wanted to show that they could get proverse yaw instead of adverse yaw with that, yeah. with that distribution. But the whole purpose of frontal D is providing the aerodynamics, but the why they are just uh, it so is I, like a conventional the um, like uh, delta wing kind of geometry yeah. that flew many other vehicles right so 
Yeah, I think they take the aerodynamics for granted, the, the efficiency for granted. I don't think they were trying to test it. They were they were claiming, you know, this is more efficient okay. and it has a yaw benefit, but they weren't trying to prove the efficiency benefit. Oh, I see. Does that make sense? Yeah, I'm not trying to criticize it, but I'm right. trying to understand because I need to take data a little bit more. But we are talking about the at the Air Force and trying to um, to under there is some activity going on, parental mm -hmm. thing uh -huh. So I just wanted to understand yeah. the, what is. So one of my, I have, I, we, I could talk for an hour on this, so <laughs> I'll, I'll keep it short, but what, one of the things, so I've met with Al Bowers and uh, he's now retired. Um, I, so I'm not sure exactly how, the, if that program is continuing on, he's been retired for a year or two. Um, but uh, one of the challenges with the bell-shaped lift distribution is that you can only get that specific lift distribution at one angle of attack. So when you change your angle of attack, you will not be at that, you will not get the bell-shaped lift distribution anymore. And Not and it, because of uh, the control surface changes? No, no. Just as you change the speed of an aircraft, so when, when you're at low speeds, you're at a high angle of attack, and when you're at high speeds, you're at a low angle of attack. And um, as you change angle of attack, your lift distribution changes on every wing except for an elliptic. If you have an elliptic wing with no twist in it, you always get the elliptic lift distribution at every angle of attack. But that's the only wing that that works on. And every other wing, as you change your, your angle of attack, your lift distribution changes. And so um, I think that's, see, this is one of the things that's not well understood. You can't just produce the bell-shaped lift distribution on a fixed wing at all operating conditions. So they could do it at one operating condition, but that's one of the unique things about our aircraft is that we can change the lift distribution at all operating conditions. So uh, we, can, we can be hitting the bell-shaped lift distribution at all operating conditions if we wanted to. Does that make sense? Because we can change the lift distribution. On. Oh, I thought there were, so, so here we are trying to change the bell, the, the lift distribution with the control surface exactly. changes, but I thought they were doing the similar thing. But they only thing. have and they only have uh, ailerons out of the tip, so they're not okay. trying to manipulate the whole control, the whole lift distribution. Okay. They're just using that for roll. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. Right. But yeah, we're I, trying, I mean, but we have control over the whole lift distribution because we have control surfaces everywhere. Right. That yeah. was the, kind of the motivation. Yeah. Uh, that that we are trying to do. Okay. Um, yeah, I think that's, that's enough. Okay. All right. Thank you, Jeff. Good questions. Yeah. Good, good to hear from you. Yeah. Yeah. I, 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 I was looking forward to see you here today, but, uh, <laughs> glad to see the, from the monitor, even that. Yeah. It's I'm good. sorry. I, I had, I had to be out of town, but. Oh, yeah, no problem. <laughs> okay, thanks, Jeff. Um,